I know there's even more good stuff coming up. I uh, hope you guys have all had a great weekend so far and in enduring the heat. Um, but uh, we have uh, something that's going to be really exciting and really uh, hot today in a few minutes. Uh, Leo is going to be baptized in a little bit here. So that's always exciting. Uh, just excited for you, brother, and uh, excited that you're making this decision. Uh, but we're going to jump into the lesson here right away. Uh, last week, you know, we started talking about a very important topic. And our lesson last week was, maybe? There we go. Um, see if I can get along with the AV crew this morning. Uh, the lesson last week was how to get along with anyone. And then you might notice there's a little just about in there. And, and if you didn't get to hear the lesson last week, I encourage you to go back and listen to it. Um, what we talked about mostly last week was how to avoid conflict, right? How do we just not even get into conflict to begin with? Um, and I did want to say, if you want to listen to the lesson last week, it's on our YouTube channel. It's also, you can find a link on the app. So if you don't have our church app, if you look on the back of your pews, see those yellow QR codes? That links you to our church app. So you can click on that and you can get the app. Um, but, you know, we talked about this, about how to get along with anyone. And our world has a get along problem. From the beginning, since the fall of man, there has been conflict. We see it all throughout the Bible. We see from the beginning man against God. We see man against woman. We see brother against brother. And that's just the first few chapters of the Bible, right? If you go on through the Old Testament, and, and there's just so much conflict that happens in our world. Most, um, or many of the New Testament books were written to deal with conflict in the early church. And so, you know, sometimes I think as Christians, we think that we're immune or we're not going to have those struggles. But, but man, it's all through the scriptures. God's people, and, and really the world, has always had a get-along problem. Now, thankfully, the Bible has a lot to say about all this. There, there's so much wisdom and so much instruction in the Bible for us. And so, as I mentioned last week, we, start, we started talking about how to avoid conflict. And there were three points or three keys that we looked at. Uh, these were our three keys from last week. Is this? All right, there we go. Uh, key number one was mind your business, right? Maybe it's not your conflict. Just stay out of it. Don't, don't get involved in something that's not yours to be involved in. The second one is let it go. Sometimes you find yourself in a conflict, but, but maybe you just need to let it go. Maybe it's not that big of a deal, and rather than make everything a big deal, we, we can let it go. And the third thing we talked about last week was let God deal with it. Um, so, if you, again, if you didn't get to hear that, please go back and listen to that. Um, but, you know, last week, I think, um, was good for a lot of the conflict avoiders in the group, right? If you don't like conflict, you're like, yes, this is awesome. We're just going to let it go and let it all go. And, and maybe if you're like, a, a, you know, you, you want to get involved in conflict or you need that sometime, you might have been struggling last week. You're like, but, but yeah, I need to deal with this conflict. And, and so let me just say this week is for you, all right? And if you're one of those conflict avoiders, buckle up, because we can't always avoid conflict. Sometimes we find ourselves in conflict, and we have to learn how to deal with it in a godly way. Amen? Amen. So, the Bible does give us some great instructions. Today, what we're going to talk about is how to get along with anyone, how to deal with conflict. And we're going to start off looking at a scripture in Matthew 18. This is a famous scripture about dealing with conflict. Um, Jesus gives us some pretty straight up direction on what do we do if we find ourselves in a situation. Matthew 18, in verse 15, says, If your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Man, here's this, just this invaluable wisdom that Jesus gives us for dealing with sin. He says, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. You know, how many times has someone hurt you or, or said something or done something and you just go talk to him and man, you work it out. You get over it. You, you deal with it. You work through it. Um, and much conflict, if we just put this into practice, can be worked through. 
You know, I, I think a couple things that are wise to do is if you do go and talk to your brother or sister, give them the benefit of the doubt. Don't assume the worst. Don't assume, man, Bertha, she was just trying to tear me. You know, I bet her heart was, was really good in what she said. You know, like, give them the benefit of the doubt. Assume the best, not the worst. And I do want to make another note. Just because we're in a disagreement or conflict with someone, it doesn't necessarily mean that they sinned against us, right? Um, for instance, AJ and I, we're going to pick on AJ all summer, right? Um, you know, if, if AJ comes to me and says, you know what, I think we need to have a different flavored creamer out there. And I'm like, I don't think so, AJ. I like the creamer that we have out for the coffee, you know. And we may disagree. It doesn't mean that there's sin, right? So we got to be careful with this scripture that we're not just assuming because we disagree with somebody, they sinned against us. But we still need to talk to them and work it out. So if someone sins against you, go talk to them. If they won't listen, Go and get one or two more people involved, right? It doesn't say go tell everybody in your, in your neighborhood about it. It says just, just get somebody else involved. Sometimes having another voice, a, a third party, can really help to work it through. And then if they still won't listen, then you got to, you know, get the church involved. And that doesn't mean the entire church. It's not like we're going to have a meeting and, you know, all talk about AJ and I's creamer difference. Um, but maybe we need to get a few more people involved. Now, the big picture of this is, is this is how we can deal with, with sin and with conflict, but how we go about pointing out someone's fault is also important, right? Well, Jesus said, if someone sins against me, go and show them their fault. Example, if you walk up to someone and just call them a sinner, AJ, you're a sinner. You sinned against me, and I'm here to point out your faults today. Is that going to go well? No. Probably not, right? Immediately, AJ is going to be like, hey, hey, back off. You know, what, what are you what are you coming at me like that for? And, and so we got to learn how to approach one another. We got to learn how, if, if we're in these situations, if we're in conflict, how do we approach that? How do we deal with those things? You know, if you have a sword and you just swing it wildly, someone's going to get hurt. But if you have a scalpel and you need to do some surgery, it, it can be beneficial. Amen? So today, we're going to look at several verses that will help us approach conflict in a godly way. It'll also help us to be approachable by others when they're dealing with things that, that maybe they're feeling with us. Uh, the lesson today also, it's going to be a little different. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to talk about our four keys for today right up front. And then as we go through the scriptures, you're going to see these keys kind of come out. Because some of the scriptures have all four keys right in that one scripture. Um, does anybody ever highlight their Bible? You've seen that? Like, I've, I've seen Bibles that are just like lit up like a Christmas tree of scriptures, right? And so what I've done today in the scriptures that we're going to look at, I've highlighted them as they correspond to these different keys, okay? Now, some of them might be two keys at once or whatever, so I didn't do multiple colors on them, but you'll, you'll see as we go through here. Um, so anyway, the first key for today, be like Jesus, all right? We could probably just stop with this one. This is probably all we need. Just be like Jesus, and we're going to be okay. This would fix everything, right? And, uh, you know, this is always the call for all of us. We call ourselves disciples of Jesus. We call ourselves Christians. We need to be like Jesus. Even more, when we're dealing with conflict, first and foremost, we need to be like Jesus. Even if others are not being like Jesus... We still need to be like Jesus, right? It doesn't give us an excuse. Someone is not being like Jesus towards us does not give us excuse to be unlike Jesus. We can choose to be righteous. You know, last week we talked about the circle of influence and the circle of control and how the circle of control, the only one you can really control is you. You can't control someone else. You can't make them do what you want them to do, but you can control you. You can control how you respond and you can choose to be like Jesus. The second key today is check your heart. Not their heart, right? Check your heart. And you know, last week we talked about this. We talked about taking the plank out of our own eye so that we can see clearly to take the speck out of our brother's eye. What, what's going on in our heart in a conflict? What, what responsibility lies with me? What do I need to change? What can I take ownership for in the situation. You know, this one's really difficult because it's a lot easier for most of us to see someone else's flaws than to see our own flaws, right? I mean, in a marriage, it's not often that the, the spouse, the husband, or the wife is seeing all their issues. They, they see the other person's, right? And, and so we've got to check our heart in a conflict. 
So be like Jesus. Check your heart. The next one, kill them with kindness. All right? Now, I, I saw a couple of your faces light up when I said kill them. That, not kill them, right? <laughs> Don't get excited. Oh, here we go. Kill them with kindness. Um, you know, kindness is the key part here, and we can always choose to be kind. We can always choose to do good to others, to love others, to go the extra mile. Many times I believe a conflict can be diffused or, or, or you know, the, the, the steam taken out of it just by showing unconditional love and kindness to one another. And our fourth key for today is zip your lip. <laughs> the Bible has a lot to say about our, our tongue and the, and the lip. And uh, we're not even going to get into James today. We're saving that for another day. But, but sometimes we just need to not say what we're thinking. Um, we need to be honest, Right. But you might have a thought that does not need to be said in the middle of that conflict. Don't say it. Zip your lip. There's a song that uh, came out a few years back by Alison Krauss, and it says, the, the song's called, You Say It Best When You Say Nothing At All. And I think what she meant was like, hey, just your actions speak loud. But I kind of said, well, she's kind of saying shut up. Like, hey, you say it best when you don't even talk, right? That's not what she meant. Um, you know, in our nation, you have the right to remain silent. Exercise that right at times when you're in a conflict, right? You don't have to say it just because it came up or just because you're thinking it doesn't mean you need to say it. So again, our four keys for today that we'll see is be like Jesus, check your heart, kill him with kindness, and zip the lip. <laughs> I'm not saying what applies to you personally, but probably all of them, right? Um, now, one thing before we jump into our, our next scripture is I do want to remind us, as we talked about last week, who this lesson is for. This lesson is not for your spouse. This lesson is not for your coworker. This lesson is not for your kids. Or it's not for your parents. I mean, it is, right? But this lesson is for you. And, and as we look at these scriptures today, what, what you got to not do is not think about, man, I really hope they're hearing this. If, you, if you're doing that, you've already missed the point, right? Because remember, your circle of control, the only thing you can control is you. Now, they probably do need to hear it too, right? And they're here, and if they're hearing it, then great. But this lesson is for each one of us. I need to take these things to heart. You need to take these things to heart. Amen? Amen. All right, let's jump into some scriptures here. Um, our first key, this one has a lot about be like Jesus in it. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Now when Paul wrote this, and several of his letters that he wrote, um, anybody know where he was when he wrote Ephesians? He was in prison, right? So imagine you get a letter from your brother who's in prison, not for doing something bad, but for preaching the gospel, and, and you're going through some conflict, there's some things going on in your life, and this guy's writing you this from a jail cell. It kind of puts into perspective their issues that were going on, right? Uh, but he says here, Ephesians 4 and verse 1, As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Again, Paul's writing this from prison, and he starts off and he says, Hey, live a life worthy of the calling you have received. You know, sometimes it's important to remember whatever's going on in our life, our calling is so much greater than our conflicts, right? We can disagree about the creamer, AJ. We can, we can have these different things that go on, but, but we got to remember and live a life worthy of the calling we've received. If you find yourself dealing with whatever kind of situation, say, is this worthy of the calling that I've received? Live a life worthy. You know, he goes on, he says, be completely humble. How humble? Completely humble. Uh, raise your hand if you're completely humble. 
That was a trick. That was a trick. But I saw a hand starting to, you know, and he's like, nope, nope, not going to do it. Um, none of us are complete. No, we're not there yet, right? We can always grow in our humility. He says you got to be completely humble and gentle, right? You're dealing with a conflict. Man, if you're not humble, if you're not gentle, forget about it. Nothing will get resolved in that conflict if there's not humility and if you're not gentle. He says you got to be patient. You know, sometimes we want things done and we want them done now. We want resolution now, right? And, and as a husband, I know sometimes I just want to get it done and get it dealt with, right? But sometimes my wife needs more time to process emotions. I don't even know what my emotions are half the time, right? But she's, she's dealing with that. And, and I'm like, but can we just be done? And we got to be patient with one another. Bearing with one another in love. Man, you got to bear with your brothers and sisters. Bear with that person that you're having a conflict with in love. That's not an easy thing. He doesn't say, oh, it's just going to be blue skies and rainbows all the time. He says, sometimes you're going to have to bear with one another. You know, already you see so many of the fruits of the Spirit coming out in these passages. You see gentleness, patience, love. He goes on, he says, you've got to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. How many efforts? Yeah. He doesn't say make some effort. Well, I tried. Well, have you made every effort? Because if something's still going on, you clearly haven't made every effort. There's more efforts to be made. You've got to use every effort. And Paul uses some pretty extreme language here. He says you've got to be completely humble. You've got to make every effort. And again, I think sometimes when we find ourselves in conflicts or dealing with things, we, we just want to kind of be done. And, and let's gloss over that. Let's be done. But are we being completely humble, bearing with one another in love, and making every effort? You know, in, the, in this passage, we also see that unity. We talked in John 17 last week about how Jesus prayed for our unity. Jesus knew there would be conflict. Jesus prayed, man, more than anything, I want them to be one as you and I are one. Right? And we see that in this passage. He says, there is one body, one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, listen to this, who is over all and through all and in all. That's the unity that we are called to have with one another. Amen? You know, if you jump down later in this chapter in verse 25, we pick it up there. Paul says, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. You know, here you see our little color coding. So blue is, is to be like Jesus, right? The red is check your heart. So this first part, you know, we see put off falsehood. Speak truthfully to your neighbor. We've got to be honest. We've got to be real with one another, right? We do need to speak the truth. Because we're all members of one body. But then he goes on, he says, in your anger, do not sin. Does that mean we won't be angry? No. There's going to be things that make us angry, right? That, that's okay. It's okay to have anger at times. But he says, in your anger, do not sin. There's no excuse. We can't say, well, I was, they made me mad, and so therefore I did this. He says, in your anger, do not sin. He also says, don't let the sun go down on you while you're still angry. You know, we got to deal with stuff. Otherwise, he says, we can give the devil a foothold. You know, sometimes for Crystal and I, if we, if we disagree, if we hurt each other's feelings, you know, we're getting on each other's nerves, we do something that, that hurts one another, um, we, we work it out. We've made commitments to each other. Hey, we're not going to let stuff fester. There was a time early in our marriage where, you know, we, we would just let stuff go and go and go. And then all of a sudden it blows up into some big thing. And we don't even know what we're fighting about anymore because it's like all this built up stuff. You know, and a few practicals on not letting the sun go down. It, it doesn't, it, it could be literally like I got to deal with it before 630 tonight or whatever. But, but really what the heart there is, is don't just let it go on. 
we got to deal with stuff, right? You can't just stuff it away. And it doesn't mean be legalistic. Like, I'm showing up at your house by sundown, and we're going to work this out. Um, that, that's not the goal. The heart is just don't put it off. Deal with what you need to deal with. Um, another tip on this, you know, just to help is, is don't hold someone hostage by, by not dealing with something or by kind of putting them on notice, right? Um, years ago, there, there was in our campus ministry, we had a, a young uh, person come up to us and, and they said, hey, I really need to talk to you about something that's on my heart and I'm, I'm upset about this, this issue and like, okay, well, when can we talk? And well, I'm going to need about a month to kind of work through some stuff. I'm like, great. <laughs> now I'm waiting a month. And I know you have an issue, but now I'm waiting a month, right? And don't do that. Like, if, if you need to talk to somebody, say, hey, Jay, hey, bro, uh, we can't talk right now, but can we get together later and talk about the creamer? Because we got to work this out, man. You know, <laughs> I think vanilla is the way to go. You think sweet cream, you know, let's work it out. And, you know, you don't have to get into it all right then, because he's going to come back with, yeah, but that has more carbs. And I'm like, no, but but, but just, you know, don't, don't put someone on notice and then hold them hostage in that way. Amen? All right, let's keep going on in Ephesians here. Verse 29. Um, there, there's so much here. Please go back and look through these scriptures and, and apply them uh, for yourselves. Uh, Ephesians 4, verse 29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. There's that zip the lip part, right? It's in yellow. But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. This is the check your heart part. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Here's to be like Jesus. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. He says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. You know, are you ever tempted in a conflict to say something unwholesome? Something you, you know you shouldn't say, right? I, I'm tempted to say things at times that I shouldn't say. He says, don't let any of that come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful. Helpful for what? For building others up. Build them up how? According to their needs, right? Not according to your needs, not according to what you really want to get off your chest or what you're frustrated with, but, but he says only say what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. You know, we got to think sometimes before we speak. doesn't mean we don't need to speak the truth in love, right? But, but if we're just saying stuff to, to take jabs at someone else, um, that maybe online, maybe think before you post. Is this helpful? Is this building others up according to their needs? Or is this just something that I, a point that I want to get out there? Are we really building up the needs of others? And I think a lot of conflict can come from this because sometimes we, we think things or we feel things and we just say them and maybe it's not beneficial to others according to their needs. Um, you know, uh, sometimes I feel like, well, I got my point. I want to get my point across. Well, it's the truth. Well, they need to hear this. Well, I can't believe that they think that way. I'm right. They're wrong. You know, and in a conflict, if, if we're not being completely humble, if we're not bearing with one another, we can start to have these thoughts and, and it, we feel justified in saying things we really ought not say. Building each other up according to their needs. You know, we talked about uh, grieving the Holy Spirit here. He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And do you realize that, that we have the power to grieve the Holy Spirit of God? You ever have that feeling when you say something and you wish you wouldn't have said it? It's because it's you're grieving the Holy Spirit. Man, I, I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. I, I can't imagine the Holy Spirit being happy about me saying something that I shouldn't have said, right? I don't think the Holy Spirit's sitting there, yep, you got him on that one. Good point, buddy. Yeah, no, it says we actually grieve the Holy Spirit. Paul goes on here, he says in verse 31 there, he says, get rid of all bitterness. All bitterness. Ask yourself, are you holding on to any bitterness? Do you hold on to bitterness at times? He says you got to get rid of rage and anger. 
You got to let it go. You got to get rid of it. It's, it's okay to be angry at times, but you can't hold on to anger. And you can't hold on to rage. Brawling and slander, right? Fighting and talking bad about someone. You know, that, that's a big temptation if we're in a conflict is to go and tell other people about it. Well, you know what AJ said about the creamer? He said he didn't like my creamer. Well, I don't like AJ. You know, like, do, do we, are you tempted to do that, to, to slander someone else? And, you know, Abby has nothing to do with that, but I went and told Abby about AJ, and now Abby's got issues with AJ, right? And so he says you got to get rid of brawling and slander. And then he says every, along with every form of malice, kind of covers everything, right? He says if you got any malice in there, you got to deal with it. you got to get rid of it. He gives us an alternative here, though. He says, be kind and compassionate to one another. Man, you'll never go wrong being kind and compassionate. Sometimes just compassion, you know, thinking about what, what does this person need? What, what, what are they dealing with? What's going on in their life? You know, why, why, is this, why are we having this conflict? You know, and, and really looking at it with a heart of compassion. You guys ever hear that put yourself in their shoes, right? Or walk a mile in their shoes. I also heard this. Somebody said, before you criticize someone, walk a mile in their shoes. Because then you'll be a mile away and you'll have their shoes. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> don't, I think that was Harold told me that. I was like, I don't think that's what we're talking about here, Harold. <laughs> there, there's so much in here, right? I know this is challenging. I can tell because there's silence at times in the rooms. I know we all deal with these things. This is not like, oh, it's you or it's you. It's all of us, right? Let's, let's go on here in Romans 12, also written from prison, from Paul. Um, in verse 14, Romans 12, 14, here's a good one. He says, bless those who persecute you and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We see a lot of this other key that we talked about, the kill him with kindness part, right? Um, we'll see a lot of that in this passage. But he starts off, he says, bless those who persecute you. That's tough, man. Someone comes at me or is persecuting me, and I'm supposed to bless them. Yeah, that's what... The scriptures say it's what Jesus did as he hung on the cross and he forgave those who were literally killing him in that moment they were dividing up his clothes and casting lots over his clothes and he says forgive them for they don't know what they're doing he blessed them this is tough stuff he says live in harmony with one another you know harmony hopefully there was some harmony this morning with the worship teams it's sometimes it's not always harmonious right and and, but, but God says, I want that harmony. You've got to live in harmony with one another. There should be this, this just peace and this, this feeling that we can have if we really live in harmony with one another. It says, don't be proud, but be willing to associate with anyone. Don't be conceited. You know, don't, don't think that you're better than someone else. You're not better because of your job. You're not better because of your home or because of how long you've been a Christian or because of you don't struggle with that sin or this sin or, you know, whatever. You, none of us are better. Do, do not be conceited. He says, do not repay evil for evil. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Get them back. No, don't. He says, don't do that. Are you ever tempted to, to repay evil for evil? Someone wrongs you, and, well, they had it coming. Well, they started it. God says, don't do that. He says, do what is right. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You know, this goes back to that, that circle of control, right? As far as it depends on you. You can't control what someone else does, but, but as far as what depends on you, live at peace 
with everyone. Don't take revenge. It says, remember this from last week, let God deal with it. I love this next part when he, he says, he talks about letting God deal with it. You know, God will repay them. But he says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. This is that kill him with kindness part, right? Have you ever taken your enemy out to lunch? You know, maybe there's a coworker you're not getting along with or, or whoever, you know, and you just say, hey, I'd love to take you out to lunch. And don't take them out to lunch and then bring up whatever, you know. Just take them out to lunch. Just say, I just wanted to treat you. I just I appreciate you. You know, I appreciate you, and, and I want to buy you lunch. Or take them out. If it says if they're thirsty, give them a drink. Take them out for coffee. Have you tried that? I don't know. When, when someone's nice to me, if, if something's going on, you know, there's a little problem there, and someone comes up and does something really nice, uh, usually what I feel like is, oh, man, I'm such a jerk, <laughs> you know. I thought this, and, and look, they just bought me a coffee, or they just did that for me, you know. And, and that's what he says there at the end. He says, in doing this, you will heap burning coals on their head. Now, you got to be careful with that one. You can't be like, it can't be like a vindictive goal. Man, I'm going to be nice to them and heap a bunch of coals on them, you know. That's, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that when we are kind to others, they're gonna, their conscience is going to be like, oh, man, come on, I, I shouldn't have treated them that way, right? That's what that means. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You realize you have the power to overcome evil? You do. There's no situation that cannot be overcome with good. You have the power to overcome evil by doing good. And if this is how God says to treat our enemies, how much more our spouse? How much more our brothers and sisters? How much more our kids, our parents, right? This is toward your enemies. Hopefully you don't see any of those people as your enemy. But that's what he says to do to your enemies. How much more one another? You know, there's this uh, situation that happened in the Corinthian church and, and where the, the disciples were suing one another, right? The conflict, whatever it was, was going on. It had gotten so bad. And we see this in 1 Corinthians 6, 7, and 8. It says, the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. Man, what a sad situation. Paul says you're completely defeated already because you're suing one another. They, they thought they were winning, right? They thought, man, I'm going to sue that guy. I'm taking him to court. I'm going to get what's mine. And he says, you're completely defeated already. You missed the point. Why not rather be wronged? That's a tough pill to swallow. If you're in a conflict and, and you want to punch back, you want to fight back, and you, you say, you know what? It's okay. I'll just be wronged. I can live with that. Jesus did that. He could have called 12 legions of angels, but he said, you know, why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be cheated? What's the worst thing? Think about any conflict you have. What's the worst thing that could happen? Well, they're going to get the last word, or they're going to get this advantage, or they're going to take this, and okay, I'm going to heaven. God loves me. I'm not taking any of this with me, right? Any of, not you guys, but any of this stuff in this world. Hopefully we're all going, right? Um, but God's going to deal with it. Nobody gets away with anything in the end. God will deal with, with all of it. You know, last week we read about Jesus entrusting himself to one who judges justly. It really comes down to just trusting that God's going to take care of it. I don't need to fight all those battles. God will fight my battles. But imagine this. Imagine if Jesus had chosen to not let others wrong him. We wouldn't be having this conversation. We wouldn't have salvation. We wouldn't have hope. We wouldn't have anything. Jesus taking what he didn't deserve, him allowing himself to be wrong, led to our salvation. And maybe, just think about this, maybe God will use your situation for the good of others. Maybe you being wronged, you being cheated, you, you being completely humble, being submissive. Maybe God says, you know what, that's exactly what I needed. Now I'm going to use that for, for my glory. I'm going to use that for the good of others. 
Why not rather be wrong? That's, that's a tough cross to carry. But Jesus did. Let's look at just a few more passages here. 2 Timothy 2, verse 22 says, Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gr gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Here we see all four of our keys brought out. We see the check your heart in red and be like Jesus in blue and zip the lip in yellow and finally kill him with kindness in green. But he starts off here, he says, flee the evil desires of youth. Man, sometimes there's desires that we have that we just need to run away from. Just leave them in the dust, right? I'm done with that. Get it, get it behind me. But he didn't stop there. He says you got to pursue righteousness. you got to pursue faith. You got to pursue love and pursue peace. Sometimes these things can be more elusive, right? The evil desires, they can always be right there. He says, leave those behind and pursue these good things. And listen to this in verse 23. He says, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. Why? Because they're foolish and stupid, right? <laughs> but, but more so, he says, they produce quarrels, right? You ever find yourself just getting in foolish arguments? Like, it has no consequence, but you just find yourself in some discussion, and it says, it's a stupid argument. I've done that. And then you're like, how did I get here? How did I get into this argument over the creamer, right? I mean, we're back to the creamer, AJ. Um, you know, maybe you're like, my intentions were good. I, I was trying to help this situation or this person, but, but it just turned into this foolish and stupid argument. This goes back to the mind your business part, right? Just, just let it go. He says, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone. Able to teach, not resentful. You know, you see, what's the goal here? It's to help others. The goal, if, if you're a disciple of Jesus, your goal should be, I want to help as many people on this planet learn about Jesus. So is getting into arguments and debates and fights and all, is that going to help them? Quarrels? No. He says, gently instructing them, leading them to a knowledge of, of the truth. You know, I've seen this on a number of occasions, and I, I did this years ago. I used to do this. And when, when Christians get into debate online with non Christians, right? Whether it's about the Bible or whether it's about something going on in the world, well, gee, you know, Jesus said this. And, and just arguing with total strangers, it, it just like, oh, please don't do that, <laughs> is how I feel when I see it, right? And, and I don't know if I've ever seen someone in an argument like that say, you know what, you're right. Now I believe. Thanks for pointing out, you know, all the things that I didn't have right, you know. And no one ever says that, right? It, it never ends up that way. And that's what Paul's talking It's a foolish and stupid argument. Don't do it. Not saying that we shouldn't try to persuade others, right? That's not what we're talking about. We, obviously, we want to do that. We need to build relationships. And those that are in our circle of influence, right? We talked about a circle of influence. Man, let's speak the truth in love when it's appropriate and in, with love and with, with love and, you know, with love. Um, but our goal has got to be to help others, not to get in arguments to prove our point to be right. Let's look at it, Philippians 2. In verse 14, he says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. You know, here he says, you got to do everything without grumbling or arguing. These are commands, by the way. You know, this isn't like the, the suggestions. God's like, hey, it'd be good if you did this. He's like, no, do everything without grumbling or arguing, arguing so that you can be pure and blameless. Children of God. And he goes on, the, the goal here is that, that we can shine like stars in a warped and crooked generation. In our world, it's warped. It's crooked. We see it every day. 
You see it at your job. You see it on campus. You see it, you know, we see it everywhere. But, but he says, you can shine like stars. And I think what can happen, if we're not careful, we can just become part of the darkness and not be the stars, right? You look out at the night sky, there's a lot of dark out there. But those stars, man, they're so bright, so beautiful. And that's what God wants for his people. He says, hey, when, when the world looks at the vast darkness, but you, your life, your marriage, your example, you shine like stars. Two more scriptures and then we're finished. Proverbs 15. If you've never read Proverbs, please, please, please put it as part of your reading list. I mean, there, there's, um, yeah, there's so much wisdom. But in Proverbs 15 and verse 1, it says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise adorns knowledge, but the mouth of the fool gushes folly. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. The soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. Man, some wise words in dealing and, and avoiding conflict. He says, a gentle answer turns away wrath. Man, instead of getting riled up, instead of coming back at somebody, whatever, just, just a gentle answer can turn away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. You like being yelled at? I don't. <laughs> yeah, if we're being harsh, man, it's just going to stir the pot. It's going to stir up anger, but a gentle answer can, can diffuse it. At the end here, he says, a soothing tongue is a tree of life. Man, think about that. Do your words bring life? Are your words, even in the midst of a conflict, are they soothing words? Are they a tree of life? Or is it a perverse tongue that crushes the spirit? Great, great words here about conflict. One last scripture, 1 John 4, verse 19. John says, we love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Why love? Because Jesus loved you first. If, if you, you throw all that other stuff out, this is all you need. I need to love my brothers and sisters. Why? Because Jesus loved me first. He goes on, he says, if you claim to love God, if you claim to be a disciple of Jesus, and you claim to be a Christian, but you hate your brother, he says, you're a liar. Not my words. It's God's words. If you don't love your brother, you cannot love God. If you don't love your sister, you cannot love God. You know, there, there's so much more that we could look at and so many more things that we could talk about um, in dealing with conflict. But, but as, we, as we've looked at this the last two weeks, I just want you to stop for a second and think, okay, how's it going for me? How am I doing? Not, not me, like you for you, right? I'll think about me. Um, <laughs> how's Tim doing? Um, how's it going in dealing with conflict? It's not always easy. It can be uncomfortable, but I believe if we apply these four keys, it can help us to get along with anyone. To be like Jesus, check your heart, kill him with kindness, and zip the lip. We've got a few more lessons coming up. Uh, next week, Boo is actually going to be talking about disputable matters, right? And uh, just things, that, there's some things that are out there that they're important, but maybe the Bible is not 100% on which way we should go. So he's going to talk about that. The week after that, we're going to dive into the book of James. So if you want some good reading on this, uh, go to the book of James. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff, the whole, not the whole book, but a lot of it is. But, you know, brothers and sisters, as we wrap up here, as our world grows more and more divided, as we find ourselves in a tumultuous election season, as conflicts abound around us, and perhaps as we find ourselves in our own conflicts, let us put into practice the word of God. Some conflict can be avoided, some must be worked out, but let us be those, those stars that shine 
in the darkness. And I hope and pray that we can apply these things in our lives and to God be the glory. Amen. Thank you.